I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes about um, sort of the nature of, of the thing. Uh, and then basically, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to leave it up to, uh, up to these folks to, uh, to bring um, a lot of experience and also very different types of experience uh, uh, on the topic. So, um, and what we're here to talk about is how to explain this. Uh, this was a Tumblr post a couple months ago. My favorite show is airing its series finale this year and it feels like someone is dying and only the people on Tumblr understand. And the question about that is, what the fuck is that, right? How did, how, how did this come to pass? And how do we understand uh, what is actually happening in this kind of a declaration from somebody who's watching a TV show that, some, that only the people on Tumblr can understand it? And so to, um, to kind of help guide our thoughts about this, uh, I'm going to draw from uh, something that's sort of classical in American cultural canon, which is uh, Scooby-Doo. Um, so can we get sound? <coughs> Sounds kind of important on this. Uh, actually, I'll go, OK, here we go. So Scooby-Doo. What's weird about this clip uh, is not the part where they can find a flashlight in total pitch black darkness, although that's weird. Um, the weird part, uh, you could hear it, was the audience laughing, as if this cartoon had an audience, right? As if this was filmed uh, in front of a bunch of people like you who suddenly found these uh, characters to be especially funny. And um, I remember as a kid watching uh, cartoons like this and hearing people laughing and wondering for a moment who they were, uh, these people uh, who were laughing. And, uh, and I remember sort of wondering that, and I remember having to put that away. Because if you actually stop and really think about that, then all of television, at least as I grew up with it, kind of falls away, uh, kind of like shimmers, and it just, it just disappears for a second. And because the laugh track was such an essential component uh, in the television of the 70s, of basically the 50s uh, through the 90s. And there's a reason for that. And the reason becomes really, really clear the minute you see what television would have been like without it, which is, uh, this is a, a subgenre of a subgenre of clips on YouTube uh, in which the laugh track has been removed from shows that depended on it. This is uh, Friends, which you probably remember, and this is an episode in which uh, somebody says something very funny. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, oh. Hey, do you guys want to go see a movie? Oh, well, yeah, why not? Yeah, Thieves? No, thanks, I've already seen one. I'm going to get my sweater. Okay. Okay, it's like watching Sam Beckett, you know? It's really, uh, you know, it's this, it's this beautiful thing, and then you realize, as soon as the laugh track is removed, you realize how complex the machinery was to actually leave space for the audience that was never even there, right? That, that actors had to consciously pretend that people were going to laugh at some point, uh, although those people were dead from a long time ago because in fact those people were, uh, were just out of a machine. Um, this is what the machine looked like. It was built by a World War II signals operator named Charlie Douglas. And uh, uh, it's kind of an amazing machine. This, it was called the Laugh Box. And he built it in uh, around 1950. And he actually recorded uh, people laughing uh, at, at like real things and just sort of had those in and he would, he would wheel this around on a gurney and he would move this around from show to show. He was paid $100 per show and he would just sit there and watch the shows and then he would sort of like think about, well, how funny is this? And he would play it like a piano, like this like horrible piano of like dead people laughing uh, uh, and wheel this around. And when you realize like that this synthetic audience was part of the very machinery of Hollywood for about 50 years, you realize that something has gone totally, absolutely wrong. And the question is sort of, you know, this thing that was called the laugh track, the laughing audience, the laugh in a can, LFN, it's often annotated in old scripts as laughter from nowhere. That's what this was. And that's sort of, that reflects this period of television. And the question is why we did that. Right? Not why Charlie Douglas did that, he did that because it was $100 per show, but why we did that, 
You know, like why, what was it about that that we needed? And the answer is sort of, if you think about this is not the only model of the brain, but the triune model of the brain, it says, okay, there's the reptile brain, uh, which is basically if something's on fire, you move away from it. Uh, and there's the neocortex, which is doing everything that really makes us human, but there's the limbic part. The limbic part is the part that makes us mammals, and it's the part that says what's important to us is what's happening with other things around us that are kind of like us. What's important to humans are what's happening with other humans. There are faces emote, and we look at other faces that are emoting, and it leads to to this idea called limbic resonance. And this is, uh, this is the only big quote in here. So limbic resonance, uh, this is written by a couple of psychologists. Limbic resonance supplies a wordless harmony you see everywhere but take for granted between a boy and his dog, lovers holding hands across the restaurant table. The limbic activity of those around us draws our emotions into almost immediate congruence. That's why a movie viewed in a theater of thrilled fans is electrifying when its living room version disappoints. It's not the size of the screen or the speakers, as the literal-minded home electronics industry would have it, it's the crowd that releases storytelling magic, the essential communal multiplied wonder. This is a really important sentence because it flies in the face of everything that we are told, not just, in fact, here at DLD about what makes the next generation of entertainment so amazing, which has something to do with the size of screens and 3D and da -da -da, um, but also it flies in the face, it says, okay, it's not just the director, uh, it's not just the writer, it's not just the actors, it's actually the crowd that releases the magic in the story. And you know, this is sort of made manifest in a million ways, and you're, you're gonna hear about a whole bunch of them right now. This is just one, and I'll close with this. Uh, it's from a couple years ago, and it's a visualization that the New York Times did with Twitter data from the Super Bowl, where they scraped uh, all of the Twitter, uh, all the tweets from the Super Bowl, and they geolocated them, and then they, they sort of like made a map. So what, you're, what you'll see here is what people are tweeting as the Steelers play the Cardinals, uh, you know, real time as it moves through the game. It's obviously sped up quite a bit. And you, you actually, for the first time, America could see what America was seeing. For the first time, you could actually feel the audience for the thing the same way you would feel it in the stadium. And then they did a very beautiful version of it where they just had people who were tweeting the word go. And this is really beautiful. And you know, by the way, this could never have happened you know, before a couple of years ago. This idea that we could establish that kind of frequency of anybody in the audience feeling the rest of the audience, I would say is the most profound difference in entertainment now. It is the most profound difference that, that of all the different things that we're gonna connect, it's the connected audience uh, that's the most important. So, you know, so let's just say that the most important shift in the stuff that we love is not that it's anywhere, anytime, high def, 3D, broadband, over the top, connected TV, whatever. Let's say that the most interesting connected component is the audience. So, um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to these fine folks, um, uh, starting with uh, Christy Tanner, who is the CEO of tvguide.com, which she's gonna tell you a lot about. Thanks, Kevin. I, I run tvguide.com and TV Guide Mobile, and I, we like to say that we're a six-year-old startup with a 60-year-old brand. Um, a few things about us are unusual. Um, we actually own the brand. Um, we license it to the magazine, which still exists, but we're part of separate companies. It's weird, it's complicated, and we can talk about it later if you're interested. Um, I just posted on Twitter some research that we've done about the audience. Um, we do research almost every month. We have a panel of 10,000 people, and we know a lot about how people are watching TV. So when I talk about how people are watching TV, it's not my opinion. It really is based on what we see from all the massive amounts of data and, and research that we uh, collect and the research that we do. So um, a little bit about us. Um, do we have slides? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're right. Ah, OK. Um, uh, uh, so a little bit uh, about us is that um, a third of our employees are engineers, and we're really a hybrid of media and technology. So um, that makes us a little bit unusual for a media company, but what we are doing is dealing with massive amounts of data about um, entertainment that you can watch, and we are trying to make it completely personalized, social, and uh, available to you wherever and, when, wherever and whenever you want it. So 60% of our audience is actually under 35. These are people who don't even know that TV Guide magazine was once the largest publication in the United States by far. They never heard of the magazine, they never saw it, don't know anything about it, but when they think of what a TV Guide is uh, and they find our app, 
they, they get uh, what they wanted. So their favorite show is Vampire Diaries, and it is the most streamed show from our website and from our app. Um, we're also taking a look at, um, you can go ahead, uh, our social data, and we're trying to turn it into products that help people find content. So we take our own check-ins on our own site, we built our own check-in product, and every day we turn that into, in real time, what's trending and what's trending tonight. So if you went to our app right now, you would find um, what the most popular shows are going to be tonight. And these, uh, these trends actually end up correlating with Nielsen ratings quite frequently. Um, so we know a lot about what people are going to watch. Uh, we also are organizing not only what people are going to watch in a linear way, but uh, uh, all their streaming options, what's available on demand, and even what's available on DVD. We let people add shows, teams, actors, movies, all in the same discovery set. And um, what, we, what we do with that data is, number one, we obviously give them personalized uh, guidance, uh, which we would call the TV guide of the future. But then we take that data and we turn it um, into a prediction of what we think are going to be the really major hits. So um, three seasons in a row, all of this watch list data based on what people start adding to their watch list after shows are announced, but way before they ever come on the air. So during the upfront season in the spring, people added, started adding the show Revolution, um, which a lot of people thought was gonna bomb actually because there are a lot of haters out there who wanted NBC to fail. And, um, and it turned out that by August, Revolution was the number one show on TV Guide's watch list, and a month later it debuted, and it turned out to be the hit of the fall. So, that's a little bit about what we're doing uh, at TV Guide. Maybe some of that is surprising to you, uh, because you don't know very much about TV Guide. I would say the reason for that is pretty simple. Um, you guys are not normal. You are in the 1% of entertainment fans. We serve the 99%. We serve mass market people. The average amount of television that the average person watches is 35 hours a week. How many people in here watch 35 hours a week of TV? Anybody? Anybody? There's no shame. I don't judge. I, um, no. On, on the television or, or uh, on like anyway, anyway. Are you in the, are you in the, uh, do you, are you in the 99%? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I watch a lot of television. Okay. Yeah. You, all right. You so and me are... after after the party <laughs> last night, I went home and to calm myself down, I was like Downton Abbey for three hours. That's, that's very calming. I agree. My excuse is that that's what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> so uh, so I'll let everybody else talk, but but um, really, um, I think you know if if I said a few things that surprised you about TV Guide, I think there are just as many things about the audience right now that are surprising uh, because um, that mass market behavior isn't known by the elites, um, the people in this room, the people who get to come to DLD. And, um, and so what's interesting is actually how smart the audience is. They're as smart as everybody in here. They're as savvy, they know their options, um, but they happen to live in Bangor, Maine, or Scranton, Pennsylvania, and they don't travel a lot, and it gets dark at 3.30 in Bangor, Maine in the winter, and they're home by 5.30, and they have seven hours of free time that they are going to uh, use to maximize the value of their satellite dish that they're paying a, a large amount of their disposable income for. And so that's why we see such large numbers of TV, in addition to the fact that there's just a lot of great TV right now. People have so many options. Um, when we do surveys and we do research, and this is the last data point I'll leave you with, and there's a lot more data on our site, so if you look at my recent tweet, you can go and look at all of our presentations. Um, but we have found that people's biggest problem is not finding people to connect with in real time around a show. It's, it's not finding something good to watch. They know there's a lot of good things to watch. Um, it's managing it all. It's missing something good. It's not being a part of that conversation with the audience, whether it's a linear conversation or the next day at work or three months later when someone asks you if you've ever seen Breaking Bad. Um, it's missing something. And that's what we're trying to solve um, as a six-year-old startup, is helping people manage their options and find great stuff and, um, and do it as, as cheaply as possible. Uh, thank you. Um, I think before we start, the kids call this panel a two-screen panel, so make sure, or two-screen experience, so make sure to tweet us. Maybe, maybe we'll respond back during the thing, interaction, at Kuhn, K-U-H-N, shameless plug. Okay, just kidding. Um, I, uh, my name's Eric. I, I work at United Talent Agency. We're one of the big talent 
talent agencies uh, in Hollywood. We represent writers, directors, actors, producers. Um, and for us, I think when people talk about social media and when they talk about the audience, a lot of times they talk about talking. And we certainly do that as well, but we really talk about listening, and that's really important for us because you have millions of people during every show, movie, whatever it is, who are tweeting their opinions about things. And for us, we really believe that that is an invaluable focus group that you can, uh, that, that you can obtain a lot of information from. And there's different ways to do it, um, and there's been sort of different examples uh, over, over the course of the past few years. Um, two, and I'll, and I'll be super quick. Um, Covert Affairs, the writers of Covert Affairs were uh, listening to the conversation on Twitter throughout the season and added some things in the season finale on the second season uh, based on what they were hearing on, on Twitter. Um, so again, it's sort of to use it as, as an intelligence gathering uh, platform. Uh, I recently, uh, uh, Hawaii Five-O um, actually allowed the audience to use a hashtag to determine the end of the uh, the the episode, their season premiere. And so they had different, they had shot different um, endings. And depending on the on how the audience reacted on social media, they would then they would then use one or the other. Um, so I think I think what's great now about the audience being on social media is, is a few things. One is just the power to collect that data, right? We, don't, we no longer need to rely on, on Nielsen to think about what people are saying or how many people are saying it. We can, we can simply listen to that conversation on social media, and, and it's, it's so valuable. Um, and from the talent perspective as well, the talent can jump in there and tweet with them and sort of add this, this incredible second screen or you know, second experience giving them behind the scenes uh, photos or back, you know, or tidbits, and so it really sort of makes a, a, a deeper experience. Me? Oh, perfect. Sorry, I was busy responding to people on Twitter. Y'all crazy. So, um, I'll, I'll, you said, I want to show you something that uh, I did for BBC America for the show Doctor Who. Uh, familiar with it? Yeah, some of you? We should be, because it's actually in many ways, um, the most traditional TV show uh, you could think of. It's been around for 50 years. It's a British sci-fi show, and uh, it's, uh, it's 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 properly, you know, legacy television. Oh, I don't need this anymore. Uh, what's interesting is that fans of Doctor Who are just brilliant at creating their own fan work around characters, around story, around relationships, and. Uh, they make drawings, they uh, write fan fiction, they perform original songs, and they turn their favorite moments of each episode into things like uh, animated GIFs. And so uh, they're doing this all over the web, but in particular I was interested in taking a look at what they were doing on the, the, the Tumblr platform. And uh, because the UK broadcast is several hours uh, ahead of the US, one of the things that's really interesting is that uh, by the time it reaches our East Coast, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of posts, uh, reactions, uh, new pieces of, of art that are re being created for, uh, in re reaction to this episode, which is kind of cool. And so BBC America and, uh, and I created this Doctor Who Tumblr blog where we took uh, 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 a lot of the, we created this live curated stream of <laughs> key moments of the show and kind of posted it as it happened um, uh, on broadcast. And if you're actually just sort of looking at it on the blog, it, it looks something like this, just like posts. And, and there, there's a value to that, especially after broadcast. Uh, but if you were, you were sort of watching along, uh, your experience was probably more like this. If you have sound. say that. Joined the Alaska to see the universe, ended up stuck in a shipwreck first time out. Rescue me, Chin Boy, and show me the stars. Does it look real to you? Does what look real? Where you are right now. So what was really nice about this is um, 
is that uh, uh, we actually got, got some really great sort of user engagement around it. Uh, live tumbling, live gifing, however you want to call it, uh, resulted in uh, I think the high, significantly higher social engagement uh, for both live and plus three, uh, plus three days. Uh, than, than anyone kind of expected, uh, where a lot of the content on brand run TV tumblers tend to get anywhere between 50 and say 200 notes, which are people who are reblogging and liking and share, resharing that sort of thing, right? Uh, per post. Um, many of these posts did 5,000 notes in the first five minutes. And over the course of the weekend, as everyone sort of caught up on DVR and Amazon and, 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 uh, uh, and iTunes, uh, suddenly you saw 10 to 30 to 50,000 notes per post. And it wasn't, and after a while, once this became sort of regular practice, uh, it was easy to find posts that would do 100,000 notes over the course of a week. And so, all to say, uh, um, this is actually uh, uh, stats from uh, Union Metrics, which is a fantastic analytics uh, platform for uh, keeping track of Tumblr stats. Uh, according to Union Metrics, Doctor Who, this small, sh this big show, but big in the UK, um, is one of the two top brands on one of the top ten website uh, web platforms in the US, and that's kind of not bad. That's it. I'm taking this with me. Should I, should I let this roll? Presentation and then. You know what, I think that's gonna be tricky at the moment. So we'll just let this roll. Right. Oh, hey people, I'd like to tell you about my weekly live show, <laughs> The Merton Show. It's a live, interactive, online, musical comedy show. You can come on screen with me every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern on MertonShow.com. And about once a month, I also do shows for non-U.S. audiences on Sundays at 2100 hours GMT. And Seamus, he clenched his fists and held them towards the sky. He implored to destiny, why, oh why? There's a little dude, little dude in some big sunglasses. These random people have no idea what this is. What's that guy? What is he doing? He's playing piano or something. I don't know. He scares me. Get him away. It's basically an improvement on the chat roulette piano concept, but with less waiting around and no naked dudes. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Josh Weinstein. I founded a company called URTV. Um, hopefully uh, Kevin can, can get the slides. If not, it's all good. Uh, what you saw is a clip from The Merton Show. Some of you may be familiar with Merton. Uh, he was very big back in 2010 when he uh, went on chat, dared to go on chat roulette uh, and interacted with folks and sang songs about them and also took requests. He's like a, a walking music library, basically, well, I guess sitting. <laughs> Um, and so that really inspired us, along with something that we were doing, which was sort of like chat roulette for college students with pants on, that this was really the future of entertainment. And I guess if we go back uh, a few slides. Okay, sure. Thank you. We're so future, we don't even know how PowerPoint works. It's like we're beyond it. We're beyond it. So what we do is uh, we power live, massively scalable, interactive video experiences. So to simplify, it's like radio call-in shows, but with video. And so as I said, after we saw the Merton show, after we accidentally created an interactive game show through our chat roulette-like product, roulette product, we sort of saw the evolution of TV from TV 1.0, which if you take the hub and spoke model, is the hub, the media, is broadcasting, pushing content to you guys, the audience. And that's TV 1.0. 
TV 2.0, much like Web 2.0, is that you have a community that's engaging with each other around the content through Facebook, through Twitter, and as you can see, through circular errors. Laugh track. Um, Twitter, though, I think, is doing a very good job of sort of bridging the gap between TV 2.0 and what I like to call TV 3.0, which is when the audience doesn't just connect with each other, they also connect with the media. So as you saw with the Merton show, there's actual interactivity, they become part of the media. And so basically what we're doing with URTV is that next generation of entertainment that um, to speak to Christie's point about uh, that, that maybe this isn't exactly what the data suggests is right now the most in demand. I think that people saw what Eric and what Kenyatta and some of the others were doing, use it in the sort of TV 2.0 era, and were like, wow, that was really good. But you know, those people, they had people like Eric, they had Kenyatta who were very forward thinking, and so now we need to sort of figure out what is that TV 3.0, we need to get there in advance. So the networks, the production studios, and the celebrities are very receptive to TV 3.0, and that sort of real time, synchronous, interactive, and so we're working with celebrities, we're working with media, it's actually pulled people from the second screen experience onto a second screen experience, but also to the first screen, which I think is pretty powerful. So for news, you can have an internationally participatory community, so you can cut to people live on scene, uh, anywhere, without a production studio. And the reason why this hasn't happened before is because it just simply wasn't possible technologically from an infrastructure standpoint. And then, really, the major switch that I, that I see is, instead of developing technology to sort of augment existing content, what you're gonna see is people taking a step back and say, the medium has fundamentally changed. Now how does the medium fit in the world of internet? And so the content is gonna be created on top of the technology. The technology is gonna be the basis, and people are gonna say, how can we leverage what is available technologically to create some really powerful content? Yeah, I can just introduce myself. Yeah. I, I, my name is Boris. Uh, um, I'm founder and CEO of Film Master. I, I feel nervous. I'm the only non-American on this stage, and I also am the first time in DLD. Uh, so I, I took precautions. You can uh, actually follow my uh, Twitter feed. I pre-tweeted everything important I'm going to say on this stage. So if you don't get it, then you can just read it on Twitter. Um, uh, what we do at Filmmaster, um, uh, it's, we're taking from a different perspective, so we are a B2B company. Uh, we, at Filmmaster, we provide a personalization and analytics uh, platform for entertainment industry. So basically, we help um, cable providers and TV networks uh, and we, we help them uh, drive viewership and engagement of the audience by making personalization uh, the first class citizen uh, in their systems. So we make it easy for their consumers, uh, for their viewers to easily uh, discover what's on TV or what's, on, uh, what's new uh, and share it with friends. And uh, um, I think Kevin can show a short video of, uh, yeah, exactly. Televisions used to only have 12 channels. Back then, people didn't have to think about what to watch. Everyone watched the same things and they shared a collective viewing experience. Today, television and the internet have more channels than viewers can possibly watch, but people are disconnected from a shared viewing experience. At Filmmaster, we believe the future of television is smart. Televisions should learn that dad likes soccer, mom likes cooking shows, and then personalize their viewing experience based on their habits. In the near future, television content will not be limited to network programming. Movie trailers, video on demand, content from YouTube, Hulu, and Netflix will be streamed to a single device. Sorry for, for, sorry for this uh, cooking shows and TV. We wanted to do it like differently, like have a dog, for example, or have a gay, gay couple or something like that. But this is really not politically correct. But the next version will be probably more. So, okay, I'm shutting up. Great. And actually, um, uh, so we're just going to talk for a little bit. But I, uh, in fact, we've tweeted everything that all of us are going to say already. So you can all go home. Uh, and 
Um, but just in case you're not on Twitter, we'll just play this out. Um, uh, okay, so so one of the things that uh, that came up in I think the future of screens yesterday was uh, Albert Wenger from uh, USV uh, talked about uh, that uh, nobody he knows that that they cut the cord and that he doesn't know anybody who still has a TV, et cetera. Does that does that you know, so especially for you, Christine, you can who work with broadcast television. Now, does that does that line up with what you see in terms of what's happening? I mean, I, I, it lines up a lot with what I see among the one percent. Uh -huh. So, and and I I live in New York. I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where apparently nobody ever watches TV. They read biographies of Cleopatra <laughs> and Lincoln and Andrew Jackson. And they've never, what's this Real Housewives? Never heard of it, never heard of it. Oh, what's really going on with Bethany? What's really happening? That's what happens. So people claim they never watch TV, but they actually really do watch TV. Um, what, what we see is everything's happening. Cord cutting is happening. Um, you know, DVRing is happening in greater percentages. Streaming is happening. Every basically, the answer to is such and such happening is yes, and the quantity is more, and and we find that it's 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 not just the one percent, but it, it is also the ninety nine percent as well. I would say that the phenomenon of cord cutting is fr from what we see is not going to happen in massive numbers. That that people are still subscribing um, to various services, but, um, but people are changing their, their habits very, very quickly. Everything is fragmenting. Yeah. I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't have a TV, right? I'm probably the only agent in Hollywood that doesn't watch, you know, that doesn't have a TV. But, and, and Nick Bilton tweeted something a, f a few days ago where he said, um, you know, we talk about two screen experiences. For many people, Twitter is the first screen, right? And so I watch television on, Twitter. If I need to see a clip, I'll go to Hulu. I'll download it on iTunes. There's so many other ways to get this content. And we talk about a two-screen experience, sitting there with your laptop or your cell phone and then watching television. I, it all just plays out on, on social media, and, and you can do that. And I am very much in line with what's happening on television every single night because I'm, I'm reading the tweets. I can follow numerous shows. So I think, I think it's, it's changing, and we're no longer, it's, it's just one screen now. I, I just wouldn't uh, go too far with that because uh, Twitter, I mean, it's a big, most successful social TV startup. It's not a social TV startup, it just ac by accident became one. Uh, still, it's about, f from, from, from my kind of very rough uh, calculation, it's about 1 to 3% of people in the US that actually actively tweet about TV. It's about 15% that tweeted about TV once at least, but active tweeters is not that many. So there's many listeners, but you know, those people who actively engage on a second screen, it's still minority. But I think, yeah, actually, I think that's sorry, a... Sorry, let, let me just say, because these are, these are very helpful stats that Twitter, Twitter just released for the UK, um, which is that of the, of the 10 million uh, uh, Twitter users in the UK, 60% uh, of them tweet while watching TV. Um, and that's, that sort of is what it is, but this is, this is really the killer, and this is from Twitter that uh, at, uh, at peak TV time, so basically prime time, 40% uh, of all UK Twitter traffic is about television, okay? So here's a platform where anybody can talk about whatever they want uh, to whoever they want, uh, and what they talk about is what's on television, um, basically during that prime time. And, you know, for that to be happening at the same time that everybody's saying, yeah, nobody really watches TV anymore, is a bit strange, right? I mean, I think this is part of the, the disconnect. Well, and I, I think there's this huge emphasis on live TV, and um, I, uh, I, I always tend to ask the question, why does it matter? Whether it's live or it's, it's you're watching online on, through some streaming service or, or, or anywhere else, uh, what matters is you, you, you do have a bunch of people who are in love with stories and they want to experience them somehow. Now. Whether or, not we, we, whether or not it means that we need to put a bunch of our resources into uh, second screen apps and, uh, and, and more streaming services, et cetera, et cetera, and, and somehow this, this legacy uh, cable system is going to go away, like, that really does it, at least to me, uh, to my 1% of, of, of Kenyatta, who actually is the person who kind of does nothing but tries, goes and looks and sees where is the audience uh, uh, what are they trying to do, when are they doing it, and then how do we better serve them? 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just, just serve them better. But so one of the things that, that you raise is, is that there are, there are more, there are more, I mean, you know, for all the different channels and networks we have, we have more platforms uh, than networks to, to have a second screen experience around them. Is it, is it that we haven't hit the right uh, a platform yet? Is it, is it Twitter, is it Tumblr, or is it, or is it whatever? Uh, I think it's just constantly evolving. There, mm -hmm. there are people who are loyal tvguide.com users who have been talking about the same shows for years, um, and then they're looking for new ones and they're talking about those. But it's, it's evolving. Tumblr didn't exist a couple years ago, and a lot of people are using Tumblr now. Um, people, people also use uh, Pinterest and Facebook, and so it's, it's, it's becoming, um, I, I think, social behavior um, is something that has always been taking place and there are, have, have been platforms for these things a, a, for a long time and people started a Dawson's Creek blog something like 12 or 15 years ago um, when in 1994 people were doing chat rooms about TV. So it's just, the, it's really not about the platform I think is your point and, and what the point of this panel is it's, really doesn't matter what people are using, um, this, that they are finding, always finding new ways to talk about shows and connect around shows, and, and that what's, what's making them connect is not the platform. Um, the platforms really don't matter. It's, it's actually the content that matters. So what's making people connect is that Doctor Who is awesome, and there are lots of people who think he's hot, and, and, and they want to know if he's ever going to have a girlfriend. That's really what makes people watch that show week after week. It also happens to be what makes people watch um, NCIS after, week after week, which may, might seem weird because you, none of you probably watch it, or, except for a few closet people. Um, and there's always a few closet NCIS watchers. But what, one of the drivers of that very, very seemingly standard procedural is that there are these um, side characters, the, the desk clerk and the scientists in the lab, and people want them to get together. And every single week that I have worked at tvguide.com, every single week we've gotten a dozen emails from people asking when those two characters are going to get together. Um, so it's a, it's a driver and it's a thread of the show. It's, it all comes, basically everything is about um, true love. No, nothing, I... I've, I've spent years studying the way that internet memes sort of spread. I have seen everything, and I mean everything. The one thing I don't get is frickin' NCIS fan fiction. I don't, I don't understand where that comes from. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel it in here. I don't understand how anyone else feels it in here. I'm gonna, let's talk about this after, because I could, I could actually do, I can get a PhD unless in guys, NCIS Unless you guys uh, right want, now. want to go deep into the NCIS <laughs> question. But, but no, I, but, but it's, 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 everything can. is a soap opera. This is a, this is a, every, Downton Abbey, I hate to tell you this, I know pe people, Americans think that Downton Abbey is a smart show because everybody has an English accent. It's a soap opera. It's a soap opera. What's going to happen to Mr. Bates? Oh my God, is he ever going to get out of jail? No, but I think I think that's a really good point. That is, we could talk about the audience and connectivity all day long, and it and we love it. Um, we can even study it. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, the content, especially today on television, is so good, and that's what's driving the ratings. At the end of the day, that's what's driving people to come in. You know, the, the season premiere of Girls, unbelievable, right? I'll admit to that, right? So I think that's what's that's what's going to be and driving I, it forward. And I mean, I think I think we'd all agree that TV is basically better, right? It's a, it's a big step up from Gilligan's Island, uh, not to put it, it down. I love but, it. But I can't. I, I would yes. never denigrate Gilligan's Island. Since black and white, TV has gotten better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, but so, but but what is it? But but what is it? What is it that's changing the nature of the shows that we're watching, right? Because they are different now, right? They're Can I, I just here's here's what I think is the, is the major change uh, since the 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 eighties. Um, the Sopranos changed everything in terms of um, what is considered quality, and I, I hate I hate casting judgment and saying something's better, something good, something's quality because something is, everything is good to somebody and it's definitely good to the person who made it. Um, if they made it as far as getting it on, on the air, it, it's got to be decent, right? Um, but the thing that changes is the 12 episode series. Um, 26 episodes, really hard to sustain um, a, a narrative thread or an ambitious narrative thread over 26 episodes, which is the standard um, season in, in the US. 
for 12 episodes, you can do something a little bit different, a little bit weird, and you can go to cable and you can find an audience for it that's smaller and you can be, be a little bit more ambitious. And that's what's made uh, the perceived quality um, is it, it's a combination of quantity and different formats. And I think that's what's, that's what's really led like to basic, it. Basic, basic, you know, ba there's more content out there than ever before. And so in order to cut through the clutter, you have to be amazing, right? And Amazon is buying content. YouTube is buying content. Netflix is about to release their new show, right? You have to be good. You have to cut through the clutter. And to tie it back, Twitter is a great way to cut through the clutter. When you become a trending topic, people pay attention. But I mean, but there's, there's, something, there's something that there's some, um, uh, Netflix recently talked about it, uh, um, where they said, look, the thing for us is that we don't have to make this premiere at eight o'clock on Sunday and put all of the marketing way and connect everybody around that moment. In fact, we can, uh, this is about the fact that it's gonna take three months and that somebody's gonna watch all the episodes in a week. Binge. So, so how, how, you know, so, so what, do you, what do you tell a studio exec you know, who, who has to basically compete with that. So that's Learn of, what the internet is. So that's uh, Reed Hastings' sort of thesis-driven approach to Netflix, is that everything will be sort of asynchronously viewed, uh, movie production quality, uh, television, as it sort of is now with things like Boardwalk, Empire, and Homeland. I love Homeland. Um, and it's just magnificent. But what you're going to see is you're going to see a bifurcation between that uh, of all content into that and live. Live isn't going away. In fact, it's getting stronger. Look at ESPN. Uh, news is very strong. A lot of the event-driven stuff. Uh, so I mean, yes, uh, there is a large spot for that asynchronous viewing uh, and that movie production quality stuff. But as Kenyatta displayed, is that if you create a live community around it, it really activates things like Twitter, like Tumblr, like Facebook to drive the traffic and then speaking to the multiplicity of the platforms so that the networks really have a lot of the power. Uh, and I know we're over time and I'm almost done. Uh, the networks have a lot of the power, I guess with the exception of, of Twitter and Facebook, as the sole power to drive the traffic. And I think that going forward, they need to be really cognizant of bringing people to their online presence. And the platforms are going to live there as hopefully white labeled URTV platforms for those networks. The, uh, uh, you know who's, who's, who's really gotten this right to me in the past year are, are film studios, right? Uh, Hunger Games, Avengers, um, they've done a really great job of turning, turning movies into events, right? Not everyone needs to show up for the premiere unless you're really invested in the characters. And actually, it's more than that. It's unless your friends are really invested in the characters and everyone you talk to is really invested in them. Uh, so you feel like you have to be there. Uh, so there's still space. For, and it, it has nothing to do with, with, with whether or not it's, it's going to be available later. The question is when, is, when is it important to be part of that narrative, right? When is it important for you, your community, uh, whoever it is that you, that you talk to, will be online or off? You know, if you can get everyone to kind of, if you get a bunch of people to kind of want to be around each other to watch TV because it's social, or watch a movie because it's social, then, then you can still create really interesting experiences.